Today's episode is brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest, growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel Greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves, and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process, so make sure to check them out. Today's episode is also brought to you by Growing for Market Magazine. For 31 years, Growing for Market Magazine has been the source of practical ideas and information for direct market vegetable and flower growers. All articles are written by farmers who get their hands dirty and know what they're doing. If you do farmer's market, CSA, farm stand, pick your own, floor sales, or wholesaling, whether you're a commercial grower or want to grow like one, subscribe to Growing for Market for the nitty gritty details of growing, marketing, and the business of small farming. Available as paper magazine and a digital download with thousands of archived articles available. Use the coupon code WORM, that's W-O-R-M, to get 25% off any subscription at growingformarket.com. All right, let's jam. Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast, episode 19, season four. Got a great episode for you all this week. I got a chance to chat with Bruce Darrell of Red Gardens, based in Ireland, about this really fascinating experiment that he is doing there, uh, where he is comparing six different approaches to gardening. He has a small no-dig garden, an intensive double-dig garden, an extensive garden, a polyculture garden, what he calls a simple garden, and a polytunnel garden. Uh, We get the rundown on how all of those were set up and which ones he prefers and why. We also get to hear a bit about the eco village he is a part of called Clock Jordan and how all that works. He has a great YouTube channel as well, which will be a great compliment to this conversation in case you are interested in learning more. But first, did you know that a single episode of shows like Radio Lab or any of those beautifully well-produced NPR podcasts can cost $250,000 or more per episode? That per episode cost is nearly double our entire yearly budget. In other words, compared to other podcasts, your dollars go extraordinarily far with us. For less than the price of even one of their episodes, we do dozens of podcasts, including Winter Growers and Collaborative Farming Podcast and a couple other new ones coming your way. We do dozens of videos, We and we keep it all free and open to the public. So if you enjoy that work, even giving a small amount goes a profoundly long way. So consider supporting us on patreon.com slash no-till growers. There are discounts there on merch and the Living Soil Handbook and events when we get back to all that, but at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, even $2 to $5 a month, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Gary McKenzie, Christian Petroskis, Danny Rodriguez, Alex Savatsky, Sawatsky, Pear Tree Hill Farm, Steve Burr, Stephanie and Alex of Blue Berwyn Farm, Stephen Smith, Alberto Diaz, Ojai Roots, Scott Harris, Green Man, Earth Care Farmer Jane Murner Cynical, Asia Smith, Scott Snodgrass, Andrew and Haley Keeler from Avoda Sustainable Acres, Tony Lopez, Thomas Eliason, Lucas Brendel, John Mills, Grown Up Farm, Jacob Arthur, Bob and Ann Patton of Hexhamshire Organics, Jared Kirst, Jay Armour, Dan Brisebois, C. Max Small, Jay McCombs, Tim Baldwin, Esoterra Culinary, Steve Larson, Yannick Laplante, and Jen Lawrence. Big thanks to everyone who supports our show in whatever way that you can. Buying a copy of the Living Soil Handbook, specifically from notillgrowers.com, is one great way to do it. You can always simply Venmo us a few bucks to at notillgrowers just to say thanks. There are lots of young farmers out there who may not be able to swing a few bucks every month. Think of them. We appreciate all the support, and we will continue to crank out awesome stuff for you like this amazing episode with Bruce Darrell of Red Gardens. Bruce Darrell, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Great to be here. 
And great to have you. So uh, let's kick it off where we always do with this podcast. Give us an idea of where you're located, what size and sort of scale you're working on, and those sorts of things. Okay, I'm in the middle of Ireland or the Midlands of Ireland. I'm in a small little town in North Tipperary, um, and uh, which is pretty much in the center of the Republic of Ireland anyways, and about as far as you can get from the coast. Um, and I have a small little Wednesday farm. It's a research project. Um, and it involves a number of different gardens, a number of different plots in different places. And in total, it's less than half an acre um, in total growing space with the possibility of more. But it's very much a sort of small scale, intensive exploration focus much more on the explorations and research than on being commercially viable or being sort of uh, um, growing as much food as I can or satisfying a market. The market basically puts up with what I can uh, supply them rather than me focusing on the market. Mm. Yeah, we'll have to discuss that a little bit more. The um Okay, so give us an idea of what the climate is like there. Well, the climate here is very interesting. Um, As you can probably tell by my accent, I'm not from Ireland. I'm originally from Canada. So I grew up in Ontario, which has a fairly standard continental, north continental climate of being really hot and humid in the summer and really cold in the wintertime, uh, which, you know, compresses the growing season into a, you know, four or five months with a possibility of maybe a couple of other months on either side. Um, it, that's in, in Canada, whereas, and but that growing season in Canada is much faster and much stronger um, because of the heat. Whereas here in Ireland, the summers are much cooler. We rarely get above 20 degrees celsius i'm not sure what that is in fahrenheit um occasionally we get warm spells or our heat uh waves that we get over here would be nothing compared to what you would get in a lot of places in north america or even in continental europe um but we do get a lot of sunlight in the summertime because we are so much farther north so we would get um the sun rises at like you know obscenely early in the morning at like four o'clock in the morning uh, and sets at 10 o'clock at night or 9 30 10 o'clock at night so in the summertime we get a lot of light but not a lot of warmth and in the winter time it rarely goes below freezing uh, we do always get a frost a couple of hard frosts um, once every decade or two we get a hard freeze um, where things are really cold for a while but generally it, you can it's a kind of conditions that you can work in the garden all year round assuming that you're not flooded or you don't have problems with uh, water And you can actually produce food year round. You can go and harvest things from the garden all year round. And with polytunnels, which I have a few of, it really extends the productivity and really uh, boosts that productivity. Um, The biggest problem in the wintertime beyond the winds and the storms and the potential flooding or the rains, which in my particular situation, I've got well, uh, the soil is really well drained. Uh, The biggest problem is the lack of light. Because the light, the extra light that we get in the summertime is actually taken away from the wintertime. So it's actually very dark. And there's very little, even though we're warm, there's very little growth possible. Um, so it's more of a hibernating process. Right. Wow. Yeah. So for the listener, 20 degrees Celsius is roughly 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's for us, that would be like a decent spring day. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. We're oh. kind of spring all the time. Right. That's what it sounds like. Does that, I mean, are there, I I guess, are there fungal issues or there, you know, like, I don't even maybe know, like aphid issues or certain issues that are kind of, uh, you know, more of a problem in your area than you would think in others? Yeah, fungal issues would be would be an issue. Um, uh, There's lots of issues with fungus, uh, especially on um, uh, because we do also given Ireland and the the greenness of Ireland, we do get a lot of rain. Um, Very rarely do we get anything that would be considered a drought. Um, although we call it a drought over here, it's not by anyone else's standards, uh, but we do get regular rain and there is fairly high humidity, especially in the polytunnels. It's, yeah, it's close to hundred percent humidity most of the time. Um, so it's very difficult to dry things out. And so it's, you end up with that, uh, those fungal issues and we have issues with blight, obviously with potatoes, especially, um, and, but to counterback balance that, we also have a lot of wind. And it's almost never calm 
or what we would call calm is actually kind of still windy and breezy. So there's always that air movement. And so that does help to alleviate some of that, those issues that we would get with, um, with mildews and moles. Um, but it is, so we have a, a lower to moderate temperatures and high humidity. So I, I refer to it as a maritime climate. Right. I mean, are the winds, do the winds get extreme? Like do those challenge your polytunnels? They can. I've lost a few polytunnels. Um, there, you know, we had, uh, you know, some pretty, pretty hard storms. We get the, re- we get the occasional remnants of the hurricanes. So the hurricanes that, you know, uh, start in the South Atlantic, the mid Atlantic and go up the East coast of North America. We can often get the remnants of those or other winter storms that we would get. Um, and every year we get a, a couple, so, you know, we need to, we need to protect the polytunnels. We need to, um, things like row covers can be a real problem. Um, especially in the winter time, if you don't weigh them down enough, they can actually start flopping around and causing damage to the crops. Um, so the wind is probably the biggest issue that we have in terms of extending the season and in terms of, uh, using any kind of covers, um, it took me a while to realize that sometimes my covers that I use were causing more damage than the pests would have caused if I hadn't covered them. And so there's those kinds of factors. And it's always possible to do things with wind, especially wind breaks and a lot of stuff like that. Um, but those take time um, and or or you need to put up physical wind breaks, which I've done around some of my polytunnels. Um, but. The context that I'm in, I should sort of explain, I, I'm in an intentional community, a, a, an eco-village, and the um, where I live, and I built my house, and I live with my family, um, and there's a lot of other people living here. We're part of a, an existing community, an extension to an existing community. And the gardens, the growing systems that I have, or the growing spaces that I have, are in common land. So they're publicly accessible, common land. They're in uh, the allotments area and different places. And so... It's not like my own field or my my own back garden where I can basically colonize it and adapt it exactly as I want to. Want to. I need to be very mindful of, I can't basically put big hedgerows around all my gardens because that would, that's in common land where people walk and where there are pathways. And so it's a little bit more difficult to deal with those things for me. But because I'm a research project, um, it not everybody can grow in a, non-windy site a lot of people have to grow or will start to grow at a windy site and so dealing with the wind is actually part of the issue mm, interesting you know i, I want to get into how you do these systems but i'm curious if you'd kind of give us a rundown of how this community works i i you know um we're always interested in these different communities and these different collaborations can you give us an idea of how the community is set up and how you know like how you got involved with it um, sure. Yeah. The, the project, it's called the Clock Jordan Eco Village. Clock Jordan is the name of the town that I live in. Um, and it's a, it's a longstanding project. I joined the project, um, probably about 15 years ago, uh, 15 or 16 years ago. The project itself has been going for since the inception, since the beginning of the idea of starting to build this eco village. We it was probably about two, 22 years ago. Um, and so I've been living in our house for about 10 years. We've been living in our house for about 10 years, the house that, uh, I built and, um, it's, it's an intentional community with an ecological, um, uh, focus, but it's instead of being a village by itself, sort of like that hippie commune, one might imagine out in a field or out in the woods, we're basically an extension and added subdivision um, onto, or an added estate or subdivision onto an existing, uh, small village that was in decline. So like many places around the world, especially in rural areas, small little villages that aren't within the, um, like ours that aren't within the commuter belt of the cities have been declining both in terms of prosperity, in terms of businesses and in terms of population. And so this project was a, uh, an attempt at seeing a way that, uh, that you could have citizen-led uh, uh, rural redevelopment, r- rural regeneration. Um, we initially, there, so we bought farmland that was right in the, that had a keyhole site directly access to the uh, main street of the small village. When we moved down here, the town had a population of about 400 to 500 people, the town and the surrounding area. Um, and now it's got probably about 800 or 900 people. 
Um, and our little community, our little sort of subdivision part of it, um, is, is very much integrated, but, uh, kind of separate as well. They've got our own kind of little management structures. Um, it was originally designed to have 130 houses or 130 residential units, but we were only able to get about 55 of them built before the economic crash of, uh, uh 2007 and 2008 which really hit us hard and we're still really struggling to recover from that plus planning issues and issues with wastewater and issues with all kinds of regulatory stuff that is preventing us from getting going again but as we sit here we've got 55 houses built we've got a prosperous community plus a whole bunch of people around um i own our house i own my site um that's it's a it's a owner occupier kind of uh development but we have about 40 acres of common land that is collectively managed. Um, and the project itself is a educational project. It's actually managed by an educational charity. Um, the purpose of the project was to obviously house those people who wanted to, and to live a great for, to enable us to have a great life or the life that we would want to have. But it's also a very intentionally a um, it's a charity, an educational charity that's very intentionally set up to try to uh, develop and promote um, sustainable regeneration of uh, rural areas, finding ways that people can live um, uh, more sustainably in different parts of the world. And as part of that educational project, my own um, the Red Gardens that uh, that I manage the Red is RED, is Research Education Development. So that's my own little private project within the uh, research and educational project within the overall umbrella of this educational project, which also happens to be a place where people live and go about their business and go about their lives. Fascinating. So on that 40 acres, are there other projects like yours? Are there, are they, there are other sort of agricultural products, projects like that? There are, there are, yes. Um, now about well, it's not quite 40 acres, I guess probably closer to 30 acres at that level. We do have some woodland and we've got a an amphitheater and we've got um, play fields. And there's because we haven't finished the development, um, we still have a lot of space that is probably seriously underutilized, underused. Um, within the space, in terms of food growing, there are several different um, things going on. Where the oldest part of uh, the Red Gardens is within what we call the allotments area. And so this would be, I think in North America, we'd normally call it more of a community garden. And so this is where anyone within the residence, if they want to grow their own food, because our the, the land around the houses isn't very big necessarily, um, we, uh, there's a possibility of having land and so you can get a sort of a, a plot like a, a thousand square foot or some version of that uh, to grow your own vegetables if you wanted to do that and so um, where some of the red gardens the main family scale gardens that i have that have been developing for the longest period of time those are embedded within this allotments area and so there's quite a number of other people who are growing their own food um, and so in a sense, the Red Gardens is kind of the anchor tenant in that and sort of the main project in that. And I'm the person who spends most time sort of looking after a lot of the um, the common space and cutting the grass and all that stuff that always needs to be done. But then also supporting and helping and encouraging and, and hopefully inspiring other people to grow more of their own food. And then we also have a, uh, a community farm. It's, a, it's run on a CSA model, um, so a, a community supported agriculture model. It's um it's a bit different than a lot of the other CSA projects, which are generally the co most common form of a CSA as I know it is. The farmer would have uh, would own the land, own the means of production, would make all the investments, but they would have a different economic and social relationship with the people that are eating the food. And so it's generally you pay for the year, or pay for a box, or pay for a share of the food. In our example, it's a community-owned enterprise. So the community came together um, and decided that we wanted to have a farm. And so we developed a business and uh, put, uh, uh, put together a business and had it financed and uh, decided to use the land that was available for growing food and then hire the farmer to come and uh, uh, and hire the people and get the volunteers and get the interns to come and grow the food and produce the food for those members. 
Um, now that's a members based and it originally started with the idea that everybody in the community would actually be part of this farm. But at the moment, I'm not sure exactly, but somewhere closer to about half the houses are part of this farm. The Clark Jordan Community Farm are half the houses within our own little eco village subdivision. But then there's also people from around the, uh, the broader community. So it's a sort of a whole community enterprise. Um, and that farm has been going for, I think, about 12 years. And it's been on the site here for about 10 years. Um, I used to be a grower for that farm, um, but that didn't work out for me. Um, it wasn't a sort of, uh, yeah, that's probably something I'm not going to talk about too much within uh, this case. But um, so there is another enterprise, there is another food growing enterprise. Um, and I think it's important to say, because I, I'm not the only person growing food here, but one of the reasons why I've developed the projects that I have is that that farm hasn't really been able to satisfy the needs or desires of uh, some a certain percentage of the residents who live here. Um, the pay a standard amount every month and collect your food doesn't work for some people. And so um, there was a space for me to become a uh, more focused on providing food. Um, so I've uh, developed more land and invested more um, more polytunnels, more growing space, and um, producing more food to help satisfy that demand that is there, that desire that is there within the community for local sustainably produced food. So let's talk about this, you know, the details of your particular uh, experiment of Red Gardens. I'm hoping maybe you can sort of take us back to the genesis of it and maybe describe what the experiment is and how it came to be. Cool. That's, 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 uh, I think a really interesting project or a really interesting sort of way of approaching it from my standpoint. Um, I'm approaching a lot of this from, from, um, probably an urban agricultural standpoint. That's where I got my start in this. Um, we originally lived in cities. I grew up in the country, but I've been living in cities for a long time. And I was much more, in, I was very interested in the possibility of urban agriculture as a way, as a primary way of being able to make cities more sustainable and more resilient. And so these were things that I was toying with a lot. I did a lot of work with um, a uh, ecological, social, economic think tank um, that was looking at how to make sustainable systems, how to make sustainable cities. We looked at climate and economics and land and ownership taxation and I was kind of the food security guy um, and I kept coming back within all my work and all my explorations and all the uh, time that I was talking with people I kept coming back to this basic idea that um, a lot of these problems that we have in the world would be either solved or a hell of a lot easier to solve if more people grew more of their own food um, and so that's a basic kind of uh, uh, focus that I have for the project is trying to um, trying to enable more people to grow more of their own food. Um, and I'm now no longer in an urban context. I'm in a rural context. I'm in a small, small, uh, uh, town context. So having educational projects or those kinds of things where I have courses and stuff isn't necessarily as easy because we're a little bit more isolated. Um, but, and it's a slightly different context, but it's still within the space of trying to encourage more people to grow more of their own food. And now that I've got a YouTube channel, it's sort of much more of an international project. And so less focused necessarily on my local environment or Ireland, but focused more on sort of existing within the broader educational remit, just as you are yourself, Jesse, um, within, within your own way. And um, but the genesis of the Red Gardens project was really from the standpoint of I felt that more people needed to grow more of their own food. But it was in Ireland and looking around in Ireland at that time, very, very few people were growing their food. Um, I could probably say nobody was growing their own food. Um, and there's an interesting uh, social and economic reasons for that. Um, a lot of people you talk to, say, 10, 15 years ago, they would have said, talked about knowing that their grandparents or their uncle or somebody in the past would have grown their own food, but they've never done it themselves and they don't do it anymore. Um, but nobody was growing their own food. And so for me, that was a big disconnect. 
this idea, this knowledge, this awareness that I had that more people needed to grow more of their own food and the fact that nobody was growing their own food and trying to figure out how I could fit within that. Um, and one of the, one of my, one of my, um, responses to that was to actually grow more of my own food was to actually do what I was saying. And so I started growing food in my back garden. Uh, I got an allotment that was sort of available at the time. Um, and they were actually going to be closing these allotment, these allotment gardens, these uh, growing spaces and, uh, uh, because nobody was interested in them. And I bought all the books that I could. I had grown food in the past with my parents and stuff like that, but I didn't really have a lot of experience. But I bought all the books that I could to try to sort of figure out how best to grow food. And I read all these different books and they all told me to do things in a different way. And in a lot of cases, they were conflicting advice. You know, I had one book telling me that my, you know, my main job was to make the soil as loose and friable as possible by double digging. And I had another book that was telling me that um, digging the soil was the worst thing that I could do. Um, and how could I figure out which was the best way of approaching this? And I had a realization back then that I didn't have enough information to be able to make a decision on which method was best. Um, and I realized that I could have just chosen one. And it could have been swayed by the arguments of one versus the other, but I didn't really know. I had this intuition at the time, which I've confirmed more and more, that I really didn't know at the time which ones would have been best. It would have been led more by the biases that I had at the time. Um, so I decided to try them out. And that was really the genesis of the family scale gardens component of the Red Gardens Project, where each of a series of gardens is following a different book. Um, now it's evolved a little bit from there, so it's not a particular book by a particular author that I'm following and, and precisely following their advice because it's adapted and it's changed. And even the people who wrote those books that I originated, originally um, used, they've changed their own ideas and they've evolved. And so everything's evolving quite, uh, quite rapidly now, thankfully. Um, but I, Fast forward uh, uh, till now, I have, so I've been working on this project for a long time, um, and it's only in the last uh, five or six years that I've really been able to really develop it properly. But I have a, um, I, at the moment I have six of what I call the family scale gardens, and each one is about a thousand square foot or a hundred square meters, and each one is following a different method. Um, running through them fairly quickly, I've got the no-dig method, of course, and I've got the intensive double-dug method, I've got the extensive uh, method, I've got a polyculture method, I've got a simple method, or what I call the simple method, and I've got a polytunnel. And each one has a different origin story, each one has a different primary focus, and it's a kind of a compare and contrast project where I can look at the differences between things. Um, Originally, I thought that in during this project, I would find the best method. And I'm no longer convinced that there is a best um, because so much of it is based on your own personality, your own context, what resources you have available for you, um, what kind of ecosystem you exist within. And so I'm trying to use these different methods and these different priorities of the different gardens to tease out and to explore the differences that exist and the different possibilities and things and to use that as a learning as a vehicle for learning and understanding uh, so many good things in there Bruce uh, let's maybe we can step back and take kind of each garden on its own and then you can kind of describe the you know how you established them and just any general insight so maybe we could start just in the top of that order you gave me maybe we could start with that no dig garden uh, talk a little bit about how that was established, maybe even some of the inspirations behind it. Um, yeah, and those sorts of things. Yeah, so the Noted Garden is a really interesting one. It's actually one of the ones that I've had the most issues with mm. um, in, in the past. And it started, I, my main source of inspiration was more from the permaculture realm um, with the deep litter uh, uh, lasagna uh, mulch or um, Nodig uh, method where um, uh, uh, layers of cardboard and uh, compost and straw or hay. And so you build up a deep litter, sometimes 
30 centimeters, 40 centimeters, or a foot or 16 inches deep of, of undecomposed organic matter or mostly undecomposed organic matter and use that on the surface of a soil to both kill off what is, is uh, currently there, all the weeds or the existing growth that is there. And then um, the decomposition of that organic matter would obviously feed the soil and feed the worms and uh, would... Uh, um, and then you transplant plants into that, either directly into the mulch or dig it, a, a, uh, dig it apart or add a little bit of soil and you plant, transplant this, uh, plants directly into that. And so this was uh, one of the main ideas um, uh, or methodologies, methods that was used within, especially within the permaculture spheres and other spheres. And I was really, really fascinated by this. It seemed like, yes, this is going to work. This is amazing. This makes so much sense. I found that it really didn't work in Ireland, or it didn't work for me in my context in Ireland. I always need to qualify that. Um, and the two main reasons um, were that this method, all this method of this deep layer mulch, was really developed in for hot and dry climates, where um, some of the problems that you have is that your soil dries out too quickly, um, and the soil is too warm. Um, so yeah, so it's a, the uh, um, the, the plants struggle and the organic matter within the soil gets sort of consumed very, very rapidly. Um, and so this layer of compost or this layer of this insulating blanket cools the soil, which is really good in a hot climate, and it keeps the moisture in. Whereas I live in Ireland where warming the soil is a primary objective. Keeping the soil warm is actually what will help you grow more food. Um, will enable you to get crops in the ground earlier, will speed up the rate of, uh, of uh, actual the availability of nutrients in the soil. Um, but this insulating blanket actually kept the soil cool. So it delayed the start of the spring. And in some cases, for example, I planted broad beans or fava beans in, in all of the different gardens at the same time. And most of the seeds in the no-dig garden using this method um, rotted and didn't germinate because it was just too cold and they just weren't able to get out of the ground. Um, the other big factor in Ireland is, was the slugs and this deep litter of undecomposed straw and hay was the perfect ecosystem for breeding slugs. And slugs are one of the main pests in the gardens that we have in Ireland. So between the two of those, I realized that this just isn't gonna work. Um, and then on top of that, I didn't do it properly enough. I didn't put enough mulch on and I didn't put enough cardboard down. Um, so the scutch grass or cooch grass, uh, the rhizomic weeds, uh, got into the gardens and that became an issue. And because you're not digging, you can't really dig it out. You just need to keep covering. And so I really struggled with that. Um, but then I've shifted more recently in the last couple of years, I've shifted to the no dig method. I originally learned from it, uh, from Charles Dowding, who is big, a big, um, uh, uh, pioneer with this methodology. And it's basically, as you no doubt know, I think it's a method that's very similar to the one that you use, where you're mulching with a layer of decomposed compost. So instead of mulching with undecomposed material, you're mulching with decomposed material and you put the cardboard down or you put whatever down and then you put the mulch on top of that. And then you top it, you'd put a lot of compost on it first to really boost the soil and to get that initial uh, um, uh, kick. And then you top it up uh, throughout the year. So I've shifted to that method. So my no-dig garden, it doesn't have as many years of kind of track record because I've only shifted to it uh, more recently. Um, and so that's the basic idea, the basic sort of fundamental approach. And each garden has a fundamental approach. Um, I can put it in very, very simple terms. Our, our primary focus and the primary focus of the no-dig garden is to uh, not disturb the soil, right? And this is obviously, most people know this, most people who are interested in no-dig and the benefits and the problems with, uh, uh, um, or the benefits of not digging or the problems with digging are, are well known. Um, and so that's, that's the primary issue with this. But then once you establish that as a fact, how do you manage the garden? And because I've shifted to the Charles Dowding more method where it's a, it's an intensive amount of compost and fertility being put into it, it shifts into a much more sort of uh, intensive growing. You can grow, theoretically, you can grow a lot of food in there because there is so much fertility. There is so much compost in there. Um, and like most people, uh, one of the key issues with this garden that I found is where do you get your compost from? 
Um, and in some ecos and that depends on the ecosystems that you live within. And uh, in my ecosystem, the location where I am, we don't have a lot of uh, there's a lot of cows around, but most of the um, cow manure is in the form of slurry, and it ends up going into slurry pits, which is then uh, with water, which is then sprayed on the field. So there isn't that readily available abundance of farmyard manure that's available or could be available in other contexts. So getting farmyard manure is actually kind of difficult in my ecosystem. Um, so I've been buying in more municipal compost, which is sort of hedge trimmings and tree work and landscape work. And so I buy in the bags and it's very processed and and lightweight and disease free and weed seed free and I ship it in and uh, pile it onto my garden. Um, so it is a resource intensive process, but this is part of the method of how do you do this and how do you adapt the method that was developed in one context to your own context and used what is what is most appropriate or most uh, useful. Um, so that's again a, a process of exploration for me. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so just so I have it clear on that first, when you first set up these gardens, you put down cardboard and then you put down compost as well, including other mulches. Like, can you just, I just want to make sure that I understand that for the listener. Yeah, it's uh, when I first did it, I didn't have a lot of resources. And so I was out in a field by myself with not a lot of resources and a lot of things to do. Um, so I did put down cardboard, layers of cardboard, and I put down some, like a little bit of compost. And we're only talking like the equivalent of maybe about a half an inch or an inch, mm. you know, of compost, because I didn't have a lot of compost at the time. And then I put a lot of straw and a lot of um, uh, basically rough grass that I cut from the surrounding area um, because it was a, a farm field that had been let grow. So it had an abundance of, of basically hay. Um, and I added the hay and the straw, and this created a mat of, of uh, material on the surface that held down the cardboard. The cardboard did the primary work of killing off the uh, grasses and stuff underneath, and then the straw and um, with compost, with a little bit of compost that I had at the time, was uh, provided the organic matter that would, that would slowly decompose and continue to feed the uh, biology of the soil. Got it. Um, if I had all the resources, I would have added probably more compost. I might have layered. I might have added a soil amendments. I might have topped up the soil in certain ways and then used um, probably better quality straw that didn't have weed seeds in them or that didn't have remnants of seeds in them um, <clears throat> because that, again, uh, uh, caused some problems. Um, so... It's it's a difficult thing for me because I can't really criticize the method, the original method, the deep litter mulch methodology, because it was it's I didn't really do it that well um, because I didn't have the resources and I didn't have the experience at the time. Um, but then later on, I found that it just this idea that is keeping the soil cool is was one of the main problems. And then there was lots of slugs to deal with. And that was another big problem. Whereas the method that I'm using now with the compost on the surface, the compost is naturally much darker than the soil. So it will warm up more in the spring and it will capture those, the, the sun's rays much more than the light coloring of, of the straw or the, uh, the insulating blanket. So simply from a warming the soil method or warming, warming the soil, um, this method that I've shifted to is much more appropriate for temperate and maritime climates, I find, whereas a deep litter mulch might be much more appropriate for warmer climates. And that was a big learning for me to understand that, yeah, sometimes you are just outside of the, the conditions, the environmental conditions or the weather conditions that make a method or a system or an approach actually viable. Um, and I found that to be the case with this garden. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes see people, you know, maybe in Northern climates or like in Canada or, or up Northeast using hay and straw. And I, and I feel like, you know, that's going to slow down your season. It's cool. It's going to keep your soil really moist at times. It needs to be, uh, drying up just a little bit. Um, yeah, I think that's a, you know, that's a great observation. Have you just one last question on the no dig garden? Has the slug issue gone down since you switched to more of the compost heavy applications? Yes, definitely. Yes. Yep. Um, it's, it's definitely gone down. I, um, there's nowhere really for the slugs to hide. Um, and to, to breed, there still is issues with slugs and we still have to be mindful and we've got ways of dealing with them. But 
it's it's much easier. Um, uh, it's a much easier process, and uh, um, we can actually not quite eliminate the slugs because that's not possible, but we can keep the populations down quite a bit more through just by uh, um, uh, different methods. Um, whereas before, it was virtually impossible. I found right. Um, I could have always got in ducks, and the ducks could have come in, and there's all these different methods. But then that adds a complication. You're kind of introducing a new complexity to a system to deal with something that probably wasn't the right choice to begin with, you know. And instead of like not creating a breeding ground for slugs would have been the way to go, um, rather than bringing in a predator for slugs. That's yeah. that kind of the approach that I have. Yeah, yeah, and I mean for us, like oftentimes when I bring up slugs, people are like, "Well, we'll introduce ducks," but we're a production farm, and that's really complicated. And even we're certified organic as well, so that adds further complication um, with you know animal manures and those sorts of things. And ducks are not gentle to crops, as people assume. They will they will destroy crops and stomp on them. But um, great animals, but not you know ne not necessarily a, a solution. Hey, you all, just jumping in here real quick to get a word from our show sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Farmers Web. Farmers Web Software gives you the tools you need to manage your entire sales process. Built specifically for farmers' needs, Farmers Web helps you to save time, reduce errors, increase efficiency, and provides flexibility for working seamlessly with your whole customer base. Visit FarmersWeb.com to schedule a demo, try their free account or a one-month free trial of their paid accounts, and don't forget to check out their free how-to guides on selling online to individual buyers, as well as how to work with such buyers as restaurants, schools, and stores at www.farmersweb.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are designed and built in Italy where small-scale farming has been a way of life for generations. Discover the beauty of BCS on your farm with PTO-driven implements for soil working, shredding cover crop, spreading compost, mowing under fences, clearing snow, and more. All powered by a single gear-driven machine that's tailored to the size and scale of your operation. To learn more, view sale pricing, or locate your nearest dealer, visit bcsamerica.com. That's bcsamerica.com. All right, back to the show. Okay, so let's move on to the intensive double dig. Can you kind of describe the process there? Yeah, so the intensive double dig was probably the first um, uh, the first book that I bought was, I think it's John Jevons. He wrote a book, uh, How to Grow, I can't remember the exact title, but it's How to Grow More Food Than You Thought Possible and Less Land Than You Could Imagine. Um, and it was one of the first ones that I bought. And it was just as no dig and the no dig approach is very, very um, popular now. Um, uh, sort of 30 years ago, I imagine, um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, this double dug intensive French biodynamic, there's a whole bunch of different, uh, approaches or a whole bunch of different names for it, um, was much more, much more common and much more popular for intensive food production for market garden systems. Um, and in a way, the the no dig intensive system has, it seems to have replaced this, uh, double dug, uh, method. Um, and I still persist with this garden. Um, I'm often asked by people, especially people who are, who are uh, big fans of the no dig methods, um, why I continue to dig the soil, because obviously it's a bad thing to do. And um, my main answer to that is, well, to have something to compare it to, because how can I know how good the no dig system is if I don't have a control, a dug system beside it? And so that's part of the answer. Um, but at a deeper level, I find I'm intrigued by understanding what would actually happen with this method. Um, so the primary purpose of this, or the primary focus of this garden, uh, the way I see it, stepping back from it, is um, whereas the no-dig garden, the primary, the primary focus was to not disturb the soil um, for reasons. Whereas with the intensive garden, the primary purpose is to produce as much food as possible in the smallest amount of land possible. Now, I haven't been very good at that because that takes a lot of work, but that's still the idea. And the focus or the original idea for this double dug method seems to have come from an observation that were made where on a hillside where there would be uh, vegetation on a hillside and if there was a, an avalanche or a landslide on part of that hill, where some of the soil, some of the topsoil falls down the hill and tumbles over and buries a lot of the organic matter that was on the top and all the soil becomes very, very loose, that the observation that the weeds and the plants that grew in the soil that had been tumbled and loosened 
were much more abundant and much more productive than the ones that were growing on the soil that hadn't been disturbed. And this was an observation that apparently people had had and had shifted this to this idea that within this particular method, um, that your primary job is to create uh, as deep and loose and friable and um, rich uh, soil as you can. And so for me, an annual process, and I still do it annually, I still do it every year, even though I might not need to do it. Well, actually, I also have help doing it, so I can't say that I've actually I actually dug any of the beds this year. Um, but what we do is uh, we do a process where we take each bed, um, and the beds are not, they're not huge. Um, and we do a process of double digging, which is kind of hard to explain without sort of graphics and stuff, but it's basically digging a trench and then in the bottom of that trench to add compost in the bottom and dig that in. And so we're digging compost into the lower, say, eight inches or foot of soil. Um, so if you divide the bed, so we're instead of just cultivating, which would normally happen in a dug garden where you're cultivating the top 20 centimeters or eight inches of, of soil, in this you're doubling that. So we're going down quite far. Um, and in the context that I'm in, that second layer out in that field contained a lot of rocks. So we ended up removing a lot of those rocks, a lot of those stones, some of which were small, some of which were actually quite big. There's sort of this rock pan that existed underneath the soil. Um, and so it was a lot of work over a long time and over many years, but now we have the beds contain soil that is, um, well cultivated, that is loose and friable and has had organic matter and compost dug into it to the depth of probably 16 inches or 40, 45 centimeters. Um, and then on top of that, it's a lot of plants are transplanted in and uh, um, close spacing of plants and a lot of inputs of resources, lots of watering, doing everything that we can to try to get as much food out of that soil as possible. Um, with the idea that if you put all your resources in a smaller space, you can feed yourself off of a smaller space and leave more space for others. Uh, those others might be other people to eat or they might be other ecosystems or uh, other species or, or biodiversity. Um, so it's making a much more intensive growing system in a smaller area um, was seen as a, as a primary driving characteristic of this garden. And do you have any key takeaways from that one? I mean, that's a really intensive system. It's really intensive. Um, the key takeaways are once you've done the work of growing, the amount that you can grow out of it is depending is directly dependent on how much additional work you put into it. Because um, you have to sow, you have to plant, you have to weed, you have to add water when it's needed. It doesn't automatically just grow tons of food. Um, it's, it's sort of the, uh, we kind of forget the amount of, time that it takes to actually manage gardens on a regular basis on a day in day out basis um, and if you have a more extensive garden like the next one i'll talk about um, you can leave some things alone because the plants can are more likely to take care of themselves whereas in the intensive garden the closer the plants you, you the closer you grow the plants together and the more you try to get out of it the more likely you'll end up in a situation where the plants will get stressed um, so you have to be on top of watering. You have to make sure you have enough fertility in the soil. Um, you're sort of pushing things closer to the edge where there could potentially be problems if things aren't ideal. Um, and the more you do that, the more food you can produce. And you can produce uh, potentially a lot of food out of a space like this. Um, and I've never got to the point where I could actually sort of say how much is the maximum or any cl anything close because I've never really... Um, I'm quite good at starting the year, but then about halfway through the year, I kind of run out of steam and I don't get the later plantings and the sowings. And so the ground is more likely to be bare later in the season and overwintering than it could be otherwise. Um, so that's one of my, uh, one of the limitations for this method is the fact that I, as a grower, don't necessarily keep up with the, the tasks and with the possibilities. Um, but it's a, I find, I do find it interesting um, that I've got the, no dig garden, which has a, they both have sort of the same focus of growing lots of food, but they go about it in completely different ways. Um, they're both resource intensive in terms of lots of compost and lots of activity. Um, but one of them is 
Doug. And one of the things that I I have yet to see that the no dig garden is substantially better than the dug garden. Um, it obviously takes more work to dig the dig the beds, and that's something that I can that we continue to do. But uh, it's sort of it's a sort of ritual um, uh, exercise in a sense. Um, but I haven't yet seen between just comparing those two gardens, I haven't yet seen the no dig garden, uh, any, any, I haven't been able to notice any real benefit beyond the lack of work, which is a benefit of course, in terms of the health of the soil or the health of, uh, the plants or the abundance of the garden. Um, there's this idea, and I think the logic is sound, that if you don't disturb the soil, you don't disturb the soil biology, the soil biology becomes much more abundant and much more resilient, and it, that in turn will benefit the plants. And I haven't yet seen real evidence of that, uh, which I find interesting. Um, and some of that might be due to the nature of the compost I use, or I just haven't run the experiment long enough, or my own biases or my own failures as a grower. So it's not a really controlled experiment by any means, but I haven't been able to observe any of that. Um, having said that, there are definite benefits with the no-dig method, especially if you're using very, very clean compost. There's far fewer weeds and uh, you're not doing that, uh, that cultivation. But I have noticed some problems with the no-dig garden that I haven't had in the dug garden. And that's sort of in teasing those things out and understanding. Having the two gardens side by side um, has been very, very interesting because they're so diametrically opposed. And yet I can still grow good food out of them, out of both of them. What are you using to measure these? Exp I mean, are you doing... Um Yield comparisons, is it like, what are some of the ways that you're comparing them? Um, very good question. It's, uh, I do, I'm a data junkie. I collect lots and lots of data. Um, so yield comparisons is the big one. Um, so everything that, uh, everything that I do, everything that we do, we keep track of the time that we do things. I'm trying to find a balance there to sort of, you know, not be too obsessive about it because we don't want, don't want too much data. But, you know, uh, I want to develop gathering information so I'd be able to say that this garden took so much so many hours in a year to um to dig or to haul in all the compost and so many hours to weed and so many hours for harvesting and so many hours for caring and another garden did different things and then I also weigh everything that comes out of the gardens um so I've got a, a yield comparison um and you know and then so I, keeping track of the amount of time and the yield and uh, the areas, it's it's not necessarily directly comparable because I let each garden sort of try to be its own thing. So I'm not growing the exact same number of carrots in each garden or the exact same area of onions in each garden, or I'm not treating. Um, I've got too many other variables there in a sense because I'm trying to let the gardens sort of be what they want to be or be what makes sort of sense for them as opposed to trying to eliminate as many variables as possible so I can focus on answering just one question. Um, but having said that, I can, you know, I can uh, plant courgettes or zucchini in one garden and in the other garden and compare the yields and the output and how quickly they grow. Um, the problems that they have, how quickly each of the different crops have uh, 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 get powdery mildew or, um, the, the productivity of the different crops and how effective they are. Um, and then to compare the amount of time and where that time is spent, because we often don't really know how much time we put in different things. And so I try to keep reasonable track of that and not obsessive about it, but, um, to get a broader sense of how much effort did I put in or, can I say, in, in, in very, very simple terms, um, how many kilograms did I get out of that garden for hour worked? Or how many pounds of produce did I get for each hour that I worked in the garden? And use that as a very, very general metric to be able to compare the different gardens. All right, well, let's let's talk about the extensive garden. How does this one work? So the extensive garden is, in a way, diametrically opposed to the intensive garden. So I've got these gardens side by side, and I quite like that they're sort of uh, uh, these sort of opposites beside each other. And the intensive garden is the one that follows um, a author called, or sorry, the extensive garden, 
which is a word that I use, um, a name that I've, I've adopted, uh, just a nickname for all of my gardens. And it follows very much the uh, teachings and work and methodology of an author called Steve Solomon, who wrote a couple of books, uh, The Gardening When It Counts and The Intelligent Gardener and and uh, I think a couple of other things. Um, and he's a grower. He used to he used to grow in the States, and now he's he's been for quite a few years in in Tasmania. Um, and his method is the focus as uh, the way I I would describe it. And I'm not sure whether he would describe it this way, but the the characterization or the the first principle that this garden is based off of is to grow the healthiest vegetables. And a lot of us would assume that while well, we're growing organically and we're growing really well, so those vegetables are automatically going to be healthy. That's a basic assumption that is out there. But that's not necessarily the case, according to Steve Solomon and this methodology. Um, and so uh, within this um, this method, the, the pushing the boundaries that I talked about within the intensive method is potentially a problem. Because if the plants are stressed, they're not going to be healthy, and the food that you eat from them is not going to be nutritionally complete. And that's one of the key focuses of the extensive garden, to, um, to do things, to, to do all that you can to make sure whatever happens, the food that you get out of the garden is going to be as nutritionally complete and as nutrition, nutritionally dense as, as it can be. Um, Whereas the other garden is trying to just get the most food that you can with the assumption that it's going to be good food. Um, and so there's a different focus. And I'm not necessarily sure which one is right and whatever, but within this garden, I just take this philosophy as given. And I just said, say, okay, this is, this is how I'm going to approach this garden. Or that's how, what I try to do. Um, my biases, of course, get in the way of everything. Um, and so the extensive garden is, as its name says, you plant plants farther apart. Um, don't try to get so much in the garden, give each plant more space. So primarily the plants, there will be issues of uh, less mildew and molds above and the leaves above. Um, but more, uh, the focus is on the root system underneath that each, each plant has a greater volume of soil to be able to extract the soil moisture and the nutrients that it needs. So it will be less, um, stressed. Uh, so that's one of the primary focuses. If you look at the gardens, the plants in the intensive garden are twice as close as the plants in the extensive garden. So there'll be twice as many onions in one garden as they're in as in the other garden, as a rough comparison. Um, the other key focus is to not try to push the boundaries of getting a crop in early and a crop in late. Um, and relying more on direct sowing of seeds rather than on transplanting. Because with transplanting, there's always the issue that you might have some transplant shock and you might have root bound, uh, uh, the roots might be bound, even if you use really, really good soil blocks and manage them really well, there still is that little bit of transplant shock that might happen, or there might be actually a lot of transplant shock that might happen. Um, and even if you are able to do everything really well and reduce or uh, potentially eliminate any kind of shock that the plant might have, in that process of transplanting, the roots are never going to be developed as big and as fully. And I've uh, I've pulled out, I've dug out sort of say old uh, uh, mature kale plants out of the extensive garden and looked at the root system. So these would have been direct sown seeds, directly sown directly in the ground. Um, and the root systems are very, very strong, very vigorous, very big. You have great big roots going very long distances where if you pull out the same plant from the same seed that was that was transplanted in, the root ball is much more fibrous. There's many more smaller roots, and it occupies seems to colonize a smaller area. And so this is a uh, a real example of um, the the difference in just when and how you plant the seeds. Now, for the intensive garden, given you're putting so much fertility in the soil and taking care of it, it's fine. It might be perfectly fine within the extensive garden. The preference goes more towards when you can and if you can to make sure that, you know, this, the root systems are never disrupted. So you're trying to plant them directly in the soil, which can have its issues because you end up with bare soil for longer and you might need to plant them in the ground or sow the seeds in the ground later because the soil hasn't warmed up enough. Um, you're more likely to get 
those seedlings um, eaten by a slug or other things, it's harder to look after them and take care of them. And so that's been one of my big learning curves within this garden. And so that's just from a physical planting management standpoint. And then as a side of that, it's, you know, because the plants are spaced wide apart and in nice long rows, it's easy to weed, it's easy to keep them weed free. Um, it's easy to reduce that competition. Um, and it's easier to manage a garden than it would be in an intensive garden when things are closely spaced. Um, and the other key aspect that Steve Solomon talks about, especially more later in his later books, is that uh, one of the key objectives of the uh, the grower, in this case myself, is to make sure that the nutrients in the soil are abundant and balanced. And the balance is the key, fo key point that he focuses on. Um, so he suggests, and he, he spends a lot of time, and I've learned a lot from his book on how to take a soil, take a soil sample, send it off to a lab, get it tested, get the, uh, be able to understand the, the test results for a wide diversity. I think I test for, I think it's 15 different nutrients, um, phosphorus, potassium, uh, uh, magnesium, all those, of course, and then right down to the boron, zinc, um, copper, and all the trace elements, or a lot of the key trace elements. And then to understand how that might be balanced, or some that are a little bit more deficient, and some that are a little in excess, how to use um, concentrated amendments to adjust those to coax the soil back into a, a more balanced soil so that um, from a nutritional standpoint, from a nutrient balance standpoint, um, because he believes and has presented evidence of this, that that in and of itself uh, helps the plants to be much more abundant. It helps the soil life to be much more abundant, especially if you have key deficiencies in the soil. If you're deficient in copper, if copper is hard to get in your soil, then everything, the entire ecosystem is going to be struggling to um, uh, get enough copper to, to even though it's only needed in very, very, very small amounts. Um, so within this methodology, getting a soil test, figuring out how much to add, and then buying concentrated amendments, concentrated sulfur, uh, copper sulfate, and adding that to the soil in a very careful and very, very measured way is one of the key things that you can do to really kickstart your soil and your gardens. And then on a yearly basis, on a, uh, for a plant basis, to feed the plants as well with a uh, uh, what he calls a complete organic fertilizer, which is a mix of, of uh, uh, seed meals or some other kind of form of nitrogen with lime and rock phosphate and a form of uh, phosphorus, all the balance of diets, the sort of um, fortified food supply. Um, so it's a very, very different growing method, a very different um, food, or a very different way of looking at how to feed the plants. We're still adding compost, but I use much less compost in this garden than I do in any of the other gardens. Um, and it's a, it, so it's much more, I use about, a, uh, about at least a half, if not a quarter of the compost as I use in the other gardens. And there's much, more reliant, much less reliance on the compost as a fertility uh, delivery system. Um, the compost is more to feed the soil and to feed the soil organisms to provide that carbon for the soil organisms um, and dependent much more on the concentrated amendments that you can buy in a shop. Um, so again, very, very different from the other ones. And it's fascinating to see the difference with it between both how I need to refine how I manage these gardens and how the gardens actually grow and what the vegetables look and what kind of yield differences that I get out of these gardens. Do you find, I mean, one of the things with nutritional density that they say is that, you know, the more nutri nutrient dense, the more flavorful, do you find that your crops coming out of the extensive garden are more flavorful? Do you? Yes. Mm. Now I haven't done very good and solid research on this. Um, but on occasion, um, I've done a few explorations and it's always very, very difficult to do because you're only using a, uh, you know, there's small sample sizes, but for example, I had a, I was teaching a permaculture course a couple of years ago and they just happened to be on the course and I was teaching them about the gardens at the exact time that, uh, cauliflower was ready. They were just perfect. And so I was able to pick a head of cauliflower from four different gardens. 
And I was able to chop it up and serve it and just have it raw. And they all, all the students, so there's about 15 or 20 students. And um, they each had a bit of cauliflower from all of the, uh, the, the gardens. And, um, but they didn't know which one they came from. And there was a pretty broad consensus that the cauliflower from the extensive garden tasted more full. Mm. Even though it wasn't necessarily, it didn't necessarily look better. It didn't necessarily appear. Now, one of the cauliflowers was from a garden that it wasn't really managed very well and they could definitely see. And so that sort of um, affected it. It wasn't as sort of, it wasn't as beautiful in a sense. But the other three, they were all very beautiful. They were all very sort of, you know, it was a great crop of cauliflower in all of them. But the one seemed to taste better. And that I found very interesting. And we've had a couple of other cases with that, like with carrots and with a couple of other things where we start to taste, uh, where we start to be able to observe and to be able to taste these. And ideally, I would like to get to the point where I've got the resources and the time and I think that things are sort of stable and appropriate. I'm doing my job well enough that I could take, for example, samples of vegetables and send them off to a lab for nutritional re- uh, analysis to just to see if there's any difference within the gardens. But I'm not quite there yet in terms of, I want to make sure that I'm doing my job properly and I would need to have enough money to be able to do that kind of thing. So resources are a bit tight in that kind of department. Right, yeah, maybe we need to get you connected with the Bionutrient Food Association. They're working on a lot of that stuff. Um, Ah. And I think that they also pay for some of that. I'm not sure, but maybe I can get you connected to them. Um, All right, so let's talk about the polyculture garden. Give us a little rundown of what that looks like. So the polyculture garden is, again, radically different. Um, and it focuses on the key focus is um, based on the notion of integration rather than segregation, um, which is a it's a it's a sort of fancy way of saying that uh, monocultures are bad and polycultures are good, um, that uh, a, a field full of one crop is inherently a problem um, and that having crops growing in beside each other can be much better for in lots of different ways. Um, there's a whole bunch of different words that you can use for this. There's, you know, uh, permaculture planting, there's uh, 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 polycultures is one word, um, intercropping, companion planting. These are all variations of the basic idea that planting different plants together can have a benefit. And that benefit might be just simply that they're um, they're using different parts of the soil or in sort of what would be considered sort of more of a relay intercropping where you have uh, a crop in the ground, but you're able to transplant, for example, like carrots in the ground, but you transplant a later slower growing crop such as um, uh, Brussels sprouts in amongst those early carrots. And so by the time you pull out the carrots, the Brussels sprout plants are really well established and you can get uh, two crops out of the ground in a way that you wouldn't have been able to get if you had waited entirely until the uh, um, until the crop of carrots was finished and then transplanted the Brussels sprouts in, you wouldn't have had that relay or that overlap. Um, so polyculture is is really an attempt to try to find a way to bring some of these ideas, to bring some of the forest garden ideas that would be fairly common within the permaculture movement, and to bring those into an annual vegetable garden. So it's just a vegetable garden, it's not a forest garden. Um, but to figure out how, how do you do that? How do you make that happen? And there are some of the sources of inspiration, um, and that the word polyculture I, I got from it's not, it's not my word, but it's a word that I've applied to this garden. Um, it, it came from uh, different stories, and this is the garden that has the least amount of available advice that I can rely on, because so few people have done this type of thing, um, and very, very, and even fewer people have done it in my climate, in my context. Um, and so this is a garden where there's a, the most active learning and the most active failure. <laughs> So I've failed a lot in this garden. I've tried a lot of different gardens, just trying to figure out how to get this idea to work. Um, and I've done a bunch of different methods. Uh, one was um, uh, developed, I can't remember the name of the people who developed it or who I'd learned it from, but it's basically mixing a whole mix of seeds together, uh, creating a seed bed in a wide bed, Um, which was properly fertilized and mixing a whole bunch of different seeds of of fast growing greens, slower growing greens um, uh, and some herbs and maybe some sort of fast growing root crops and scattering them as a broadcast scatter method of of 
across a whole bed. And then your job was to go in and thin. But with all of these plants, all of the thinnings are edible. So you're getting a crop right off the ground. You're getting the baby greens. And then you're getting the, the, uh, um, the teen leaf plants. And so your project, your job is to thin out to make sure that the remaining plants have enough space to be able to grow. And as you're thinning, you're actually harvesting something and you're getting things to eat. And then to transplant as holes appear or as you harvest different things to transplant in other plants like the longer standing brassica plants or to empty a patch and to sow in later season or warmer season crops and to allow those that much more fluid and much more random planting. And I tried that and it didn't work for me. Um, mm. My brain doesn't work that way. Uh, and um, I think more importantly, it's a kind of a method that is much more useful for somebody who has a garden right outside their back garden, right outside the back door where you're in, you're in the garden every day and you're harvesting from that garden every day. Whereas my gardens are, you know, uh, I think they're 400 meters, 300 meters away from my house. And I've got six gardens plus a whole other big growing project. And so I don't give it enough attention for that method. And I always ended up with all of the greens overpowering each other and they all bolting and running out of fertility and running out of soil moisture and everything was way too stressed. Um, another version, I should say that another version of this and one of the inspirations that I took from it was the three sisters of the traditional planting of indigenous, of some of the indigenous cultures of North America, uh, using the three sisters of corn, squash and beans, plus potentially other uh, leafy vegetables um, and the, the, the synchronicities that those three plants have as a, as a unified growing set, as a guild. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to grow squash in, in Ireland. It's not that easy. Um, the, the corn, yeah, it's much harder to grow. And beans, it is possible, but it's, it's a just a season. So we can't really grow corn, squash, and beans, but it's trying to grow those kinds of things as well. Um, so I've struggled with this garden, but I keep persevering and I keep developing. And in, in a way, I'm doing too many new things at once. But I've shifted more recently to adapting uh, a method that I'd, I'd kind of dismissed in the past uh, as being kind of appropriate for small scale back gardens, um, which was the square foot gardening method. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but the square foot gardening method is, as it says, you make a raised bed and you divide the bed up into square feet and you plant each, each grid, each square foot grid with a different crop. Um, and for me, I've taken this and adapted it. It's not a square foot. It's actually closer to two square feet, um, each, each cluster, each section, but as a way of organizing the garden. Um, so I can think, okay, there's a cluster or there's a section and I can plant each section can have say five onion plants in it or eight beetroot plants in it or uh, 20 um, uh, rocket or uh, spicy greens in there or four heads of lettuce or three heads of lettuce or one runner bean plant. Um, or I might need uh, four or five clusters for one courgette or zucchini plant. And as a different way of organizing the, the layout of the garden, so instead of having beds, with a, a plant per a crop per bed or having nice long rows of things where there's like a nice long, long row of onions and then a nice long row of garlic and a nice long row of carrots. This is more where you have clusters where each cluster is just one vegetable or one type, but those clusters are ranged. I, I have 60 clusters in a big bed or 360 clusters or 360 sort of units to be able to swap around and be much more random within the growing system. And so I've been trying this method as a way of how to organize the plans, how to make this method work for me in my context, the way that my brain works and the amount of attention that I can give it. And also the fact that I want to plan things because I've got way too much to so I keep track of during the year. So I try to get all the planning done at the beginning of the year. Um, and I think it's getting there. I think that there is something really there, that there is a way of being able to approach a garden in a different structural way, a different way of organizing things and a different way of conceiving of how things can plant beside each other. And it has its constraints and it has its issues, which I'm still dealing with, but it also 
opens up a lot more possibilities because it's easy to introduce and to just throw in something different and to add different types of crops and diversify things. Whereas when you've got one long line of plants, it's harder to fit other things into it. Um, so that again has been one of my one of my key learning areas and the garden that I'm continuing to learn the most from and uh, continue to explore the most with. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I need to get you a copy of my book because I actually agree with you that there hasn't been a lot of information about how to do these sort of, you know, polyculture, uh, what we call often call interplanting. So yeah, I dedicated a big portion of my book to trying to, to add, shed some light on that. Um, so I'd be curious to see if, you know, if it was helpful to you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's move on to the simple garden. What's, what's, yeah. How does this one work? So the simple garden is a direct response to the polyculture garden and uh, to the other gardens. And the other four gardens um, are, there's lots of crops and lots of complexity and trying to fit all the things in and trying to understand managing one garden is hard enough, but managing, you know, multiple gardens is, is, uh, is that much more difficult, you know, instead of having 40 or 50 or 60 crops to think about and to organize and to plant in a given year. If you've got a really abundant garden, uh, you know, you multiply that by six and it goes up quite substantially. Um, so the simple garden, I had the opportunity to, to develop, to add another garden to the set that I have. And um, I was wondering what kind of method to do. And I was frustrated with all the work that the other gardens take. And so I decided to basically the simple garden is my, my design solution to some of the issues that I've had problems with in the other gardens. Um, and it's basically the, so the primary objective, the primary focus is to, uh, have the least amount of work total in the garden. Um, but to design it carefully. And I should say that my, my background is as an architect. I was edu educated as an architect and I worked as an architect for a while. So I approach a lot of these things with the brain of an architect. And so this was a design challenge. Um, and so I started out fairly fundamentally. So I tried to go back to first principles with this gardens. And I said, okay, this garden isn't for everything and it's not for everybody. But if you were in a situation where you wanted to get food, but didn't or couldn't want didn't want to put in a lot of work or didn't have the time to be able to put into it, how would you manage a garden or how would, how would you potentially manage a garden? And so I started with the standpoint of radically reducing the number of crops, the diversity of crops. So I only have four crops. So there's four staple crops. And all of those crops are crops that I can harvest all at once and put into storage. So it's just storage crops. So I get nothing out of this garden in the spring, summer, and early autumn. I don't get anything. I could go in and dig up some or some potatoes, or I could uh, pull a few onions out, or I could get some carrots. But you know, it's basically the idea that this is the garden that's going to feed you over the winter. Uh, you might have another garden somewhere else that feeds you during the summer, but this is the garden that might be farther away that you spend less time at that is just going to feed feed you over the winter. So I've radically reduced it to four crops that are all relatively easy to maintain. Um, none of them need to be harvested on a regular basis, like uh, courgettes or zucchini or other crops that you have to continually harvest or else they just get completely out of control. So there's no fruiting crops in this. There's no leaf crops. It's all roots and uh, fruit. Well, okay, uh, there's storage fruit in the squash. So the four crops are squash, onions, storage onion, storage, storage carrots, and uh, main crop potatoes. Um, so that radically reduces the amount of work that I need and focus and attention that the gardens need in during the summer. Um, so it's the kind of garden that you can go on holidays for a couple of weeks and not have to worry about. Um, then the other thing is I divided the, there's a, the, the garden is divided into three. So it's three beds and I was looking at fertility management and the crop rotation and how to rotate from one crop to another. Um, the, so I started with, um, so there's one bed of squash and one bed of potatoes and one bed that is split in half between the carrots and the onions. Um, and so the crop rotation system starts with a couple of different things and it starts, it, it's easiest to conceive of it with a, with a squash rotation. Um, so as I'm preparing the bed, as I am now, for the squash to be planted in in a couple of months' time, um, I'm doing, on that section of the garden, I'm using what's called a, what I call a sheet composting. 
So I'm gathering up uh, material from around the ecosystem, uh, cut grasses. I'm using my scythe to get some to clear some of the older grasses in the area. Later in the spring, when the nettles start to come out, I'll harvest a whole bunch of nettles and I'll harvest a whole bunch of um, of the comfrey come th from the comfrey patch. And in the past, I've used I've dug out uh, a compost bin that was only partially decomposed and put that on the surface. And so this is basically all the decomposing or the potentially decomposing matter, all that potential organic matter is on the surface. So it's basically a big compost pile spread out over the whole bed. And that is covered with a ground cover fabric. Um, and so I have quite a few months over the winter and well into the spring to load that one third of the garden with huge amounts of fertility, huge amounts of organic matter cut the grass and I dumped, I've got a place to cut, dump my grass. I've got a place to sort of throw anything that I don't really know where to, where to put it. And I cover the whole thing with ground cover fabric and I plant two sheets of ground cover fabric that meet in the middle. And I plant my squash plants down in between those two sheets. And so there's a 10 foot wide or three meter wide bed that the squash can grow over and the roots will grow underneath. And so the squash uh, is fairly well known as being able to, you know, you can grow squash plants in compost piles. They, they quite like that active decomposition process. Um, and the vines of the squash, I don't have to worry about weeding because of the ground cover fabric and it keeps everything down and, and uh, moist. So the decomposition uh, takes place and basically keeps the garden clean. And when I harvest the squash, I just leave all the vines and everything just on the surface and I walk away for the year, for the winter. And then in the spring, when I come back, I pull off the ground cover fabric um, and uh, uh, scrape back and rake off all of the undecomposed material on the surface uh, and put that under the next bed, which will be the squash bed, because that's in the part of the rotation. So the squash has moved over one section. But in this section, it's the first time I actually dig the soil. And so I'll dig the soil. And there won't be any weeds in it if I've done my job properly. And there'll still be a lot of fertility left over from the decomposition, decomposition the year before. And I dig that soil and I plant my main crop potatoes. And when I dig the potatoes, when I put the potatoes in, I earth them up and then we dig the soil again when we dig out the potatoes. And so that's the only time the soil is cultivated. And that's only in one third of the garden. So each year I'm only digging one third of the garden. And then once the potatoes are out in the autumn, I rake because the soil will be nice and loose because I've dug it, done all that digging. I've done all that digging. Um, I rake the surface of the soil, make some nice seed beds, and cover them with more ground cover fabric um, to let them sort of sit. And then in the spring, the following year, so now we're going into the third year or the third year of the rotation. Um, I pull back half of the sheet and I plant my onion sets or by, so my, my, my onion transplants and I pull back the other one and I sow carrots. And then those beds are really well dug and very, very weed free, um, and don't need as much fertility as either the squash or the potatoes. And so the idea is that the fertility will still be left over. I might top it up a bit with some concentrated fertility, some chicken manure pellets or some, uh, blood bone meal or something like that. Um, and then I get a crop of those. Uh, um, and then once those crops come out of the ground, I revert to the sheet composting method in preparation for the squash in the fourth year. So it's a three year rotation. Um, and it's been quite successful. Uh, some years the squash doesn't do so well and other years I've had issues with uh, mildew on the onions and other years I've had uh, issues with carrot germination and, and different and blight on the potatoes. So there's no, it's not without issues. But the amount of food that I get out for the amount of work that I put in is remarkably different than in the other gardens. Um, and it's a garden I don't stress about, I don't have to worry about, I don't have to really think about a lot of the time. And during the growing season, there's very little work that needs to be done, apart from keeping up with watering and maybe weeding uh, a couple of the beds and um, earthing up the potatoes uh, uh, and thinning the carrots and those kinds of things. Um, but just to compare with the other gardens, uh, I've been able to get, you know, about 500 kilograms, which is about a half a ton of vegetables out of this garden, um, which is comparable to some of the other gardens. Um, but the difference is that it takes about a third of the time to get that amount of food. So in some of the other gardens, I might get five or six kilograms for every hour that I put in. In this garden, I would get maybe 15 kilograms or 30 pounds of 
or 35 pounds of vegetables for every hour that I put in during the year. And that's an abundance uh, that uh, return. And again, that basically feeds us through the winter. It provides the onions, carrots, squash, and potatoes that will keep us well fed at least um, uh, with uh, all the other preserves and all the other things that I've stored from the other gardens throughout the winter. Uh, I, I think that sounds great. That's a really uh, fascinating approach to to gardening. And I, and I love that it kind of harps back to what you were talking about, just like trying to find methods that make sense for backyard gardening, that make sense for people growing their own food. Um, well, let's talk about this last garden then, the, poly, the polytunnel garden. Yeah, so the polytunnel garden is um, is the primary focus of the or the original move, the, 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 uh, the origin story in a sense of this garden is – to uh, create the best uh, um, microclimate for growing vegetables. So you're focusing on, first and foremost, creating the best microclimate. Um, and in Ireland, because of, our, uh, because of the wind, which can be a big factor in, in terms of limiting, cooling the plants and limiting, and because of the lack of heat, um, generally during the season, um, the polytunnel, using a polytunnel is the easiest and most effective way of creating a, um, a better eco, a better microclimate for the gardens. And so I've got a polytunnel that's uh, five meters by 20 meters. So it's a uh, hundred square meters, a thousand square foot. So it's the same size as the other gardens. And um, instead of like if I wasn't doing this crazy project and uh, and just growing food for myself, I would fill a polytunnel full of all the warm season fruiting crops and maybe a couple of overwintering crops and grow everything else outside. But in this garden, um, in this polytunnel garden, I'm taking the approach of, uh, well, what would happen if this was the only garden that a family had? So I'm growing a wide variety of different uh, 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 crops in there. Um, so I grow a lot of potatoes in the gardens, not all year, but in the spring. Um, I grow onions and garlic and I grow leeks and a lot of things that people would normally sort of never consider to take up a polytunnel space with because they grow really quite well outside. In addition to the tomatoes and uh, cucumbers and peppers and aubergine or eggplant that that just don't grow outside in Ireland. Um and it's by its very nature, because of the warm climate, plants grow or the the, the considerably warmer and calmer climate, uh, plants grow much faster. And so you can get more crops in any given season. And so it has a lot of similarities to the intensive garden. You know, that because you've put in that investment of all that plastic and all that steel frame, um, you might as well put in additional investment to be able to get food out of it, to be able to get more crops out of it and put in more fertility. So in a sense, um, once that initial uh, move of creating that microclimate, it adopts uh, a lot of the methods that I use in the intensive garden and also in the no-dig gardens because I've shifted I started digging the beds in this garden and I used a dug uh, soil bed method, but I've shifted in the last couple of years to, to minimizing the, uh, the amount of tillage that I do in the garden. Um, the soil is nice and loose and friable and it's stone free and weed free. And so I do this system where, inst where in most times between crops, I will simply just clear off the surface and add another layer of compost and maybe some concentrated amendments uh, to the soil. So it's shifted into a no dig, uh, uh, method, um, partially because, uh, I just don't need to do it and it saves some time and effort. Um, this garden used to take a huge amount of time, especially before I put in automatic watering systems. I used to water everything by hand, which was huge. And now I've got both drip line systems and sprinkler systems and timers. And so that takes a huge amount of work out of it. Um, and because I've got the structure, I can hang tomato plants from it. I can hang beans from it. I can grow a huge variety of different crops. And especially in Ireland, you can get things uh, out of the out of the garden year round. Um, now, because of my the ebb and flow of my own attention and my own uh, personality, I've I'm become very good at getting really abundant crops in the spring and in the early summer, and then really good in the autumn or in the summer and autumn uh, with the fruiting crops. But then the autumn, later autumn and overwintering crops, I tend to, uh, again, run out of steam. And so at this moment, there's some things to eat in the garden, but I could have a lot more going on in there all year round. Um, and so it takes, it's, it's not, in ways, it's quite similar to some of the other gardens. Um, 
I also take soil tests in this garden and I do the, uh, the soil amendments that I use from the extensive garden. So it's taking some of the better methods from some of the other gardens and bringing them inside. Um, but this garden in our ecosystem, I can get twice as much food out of it. Um, easily, I can get a ton of food out of this space, out of a thousand square or a thousand square foot. Whereas in the outside gardens, it's more likely to be um, half that, if not less, um, depending on how much effort I put into it and how much uh, uh, how much I push and how much uh, the types of crops that I grow, of course. So that's basically the six gardens. I've got a seventh garden, which I'm, yeah, I, I need to change. And I, I tried something that wasn't working. Um, but that's the, the sort of the, the bulk of the, uh, what I call the family scale growing project, uh, the family scale gardens. And they're the longest standing project, part of the project and the, um, the place that I'm learning the most at. Yeah, that's great. It's, it's fascinating to hear that's kind of what you've, you know, you've, it's been a culmination of the the th- the parts of the other gardens that you liked the most uh, were kind of put under the tunnel. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of similarities between the different gardens, and there's a lot of things that I just do the same thing in all the gardens. And you know, I trying to find that balance between not being sort of just simple and logical and using methods versus just well taking the opportunity to try something different in different gardens, which tends to complicate things and make them perhaps less comparable. Um, but uh, I'm more interested in trying things out while still maintaining the basis, the basics of uh, the uh, the gardens, and less. I'm becoming less and less interested in the fundamental numbers of which one produced the maximum amount and which one did the least amount of time, um, because most people aren't so concerned about that when they're growing food for themselves. They're more concerned with. I think having a growing system that resonates with them and satisfies their primary desires. Some people want order and focus. Other people want a little bit more chaos. Some people just aren't going to ever dig the soil and other people, nope, digging is what I like doing. And, you know, sort of accepting that these are different ways that different people are going to approach their gardens and trying to take those and build from them. I, you know, I I think one way of asking this question would be, do you have a favorite? But I think the more, the more, uh, interesting question would be if you had to drop one of these gardens, which one would you drop? Like, would you, would you never, would you never suggest never want to do necessarily on a larger scale? Um, oh, that's, oh, that's tough. On a larger scale, I dropped the polyculture, I think. Um, or the way that I've approached polyculture, I think the way that you frame it, um, in, uh, you didn't use the word intercropping, you use, um, interplanting, yeah, interplanting. I think there's real benefit in that, but at a more extensive or at a more intensive level, at a more complex level, I think is just, it's just way too much. Um, the, my favorite garden would be the polytunnel because, you know, I can grow the most food and I can grow tomatoes in it. And I love tomatoes. And so it's my favorite garden. Um, and it also uh, incorporates a whole bunch of other issues there. And it's a garden I like being in the most. It's sort of, it's not, it's nice and warm and hot in the summer. And I like the heat and it's not so windy or wet and rainy in the, in the winter time. And I'm happy and the plants are happy. And uh, it's, it's much, it's more, it takes more work, um, but it's a much easier garden to get uh, uh, good crops out of. I, I would have to admit my biases in favor of the extensive garden and the Steve Solomon's approach. Um, the idea of, of doing the work from a scientific standpoint of getting lab tests and, and building the mineral balance of the soil as a first and primary focus makes a lot more sense to me. Because it's something that that's the way my brain works. And that's sort of where it's a kind of an interventionist standpoint, whereas some of the other gardens are more of the um, ah, sure, compost is good and more compost is better and all compost is good. Um, and the soil biology will take care of it. I'm being a bit flippant there, but, you know, when, when um, that that active intervention of of not necessarily assuming that the soil is healthy not necessarily assuming that the things are going to correct themselves by using the technology that's out there to be able to test the soil and to be able to buy things that come from a factory and to be able to do that work in a careful and and uh, intentional way, um, trying to do the least amount of damage, but to try to build that as a base. And then once you've got that as a base, I think the soil biology will work a lot better. The ecosystem will work a lot better. 
um, you'll be aware of those deficiencies and be able to perhaps work towards uh, uh, correcting those. Because I think that so much of the land that we take on has been abused. And we can't assume that we can bring it back into health without active intervention. But then after that, I think one of the things that I like about the, the extensive method is um, you can, if you have more time and you're comfortable with your soil fertility, then you can plant more intensively. You can push the boundaries. You can put things closer together. Um, and if you've got access to water and if it's a good season, then you can grow more in a smaller space. But if you don't have the time and if the resources are scarce or if water is an issue, then you can, you can, I like the idea that that's natural within implicit within the extensive method, a way that I see it, that you can respond to that by planting the plants farther apart or even going in and taking out every second plant because that will become, so it's more resilient and it can adapt to that resilience and can include my own uh, uh, shift of focus and availability and attention. Um, so that if I suddenly couldn't manage the garden very well, I know that it can, or have to go away on holidays or have to go away and visit my parents, um, that I'm not so concerned about sort of things getting stressed in the gardens. And so it alleviates a certain amount of, of pressure. Um, so that would probably be of the outside gardens, the one that I would focus on, but I don't know whether I dig again. You know, because I do think I do see the benefits of not digging. I don't know necessarily whether I would um, use some of the methods that I, I, I use in some of the other gardens. But yeah, I don't know. I kind of I've kind of grown to like all of them, uh, which is good. Yeah, that is good. I mean, it just it's that's an interesting uh, observation after all these different experiments. Um, well, Bruce Darrell. Thank you so much for your time and for detailing all these. And we will absolutely make sure that everybody knows they can go see these physically on your YouTube channel and see a lot of your observations yes. right there. Um, thank you so much. Well, thanks for thanks for including me in your podcast series. It's been great to be able to talk about these things. I've never talked about this in, in this way. I often talk about it to people on the ground when I'm teaching courses, but never in this kind of more um, broadcast way. And it's nice to be able to uh, be very, um, to have the time to be very verbose and to talk in detail about all these things, because that's where the most interesting things are, I think. Absolutely. It brings out a different uh, uh, set of information and it's always really interesting to listen to uh, people talk about their systems. So um, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. If you enjoyed that episode, make sure to follow Red Gardens on YouTube and Instagram and all the places. We will hook it up with links in the show notes. Some quick ways to support our work. You can swing over to notillgrowers.com and pick up a copy of my book, The Living Soil Handbook. Proceeds from that sale at notillgrowers.com go to making you more free content. Then mow us a little to at no-till growers or PayPal to notillgrowers at gmail.com. All that works too. And we super duper appreciate it. And of course, if you have not already, or maybe if you haven't in a long time, join us on patreon.com slash no till growers. Thank you. However, you find a way to support our work. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you are getting it and leave a review. But this week, all reviews will be compared to all the other reviews so that we can tell which kind of review works best for us in our context. Today's episode was brought to you in part by a grant from Southern Sayer. Big thanks to Jackson Roulette for all his work, Josh Satin for the video guidance, Willie Breeding for the theme music, and of course my amazing wife, Hannah Crabtree. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. I'm intrigued that you have things um, so planned out in advance with my YouTube. I, I sort of like, you know, I'm rushing to finish a video and then get it up. It's sort of like, you know, <laughs> something goes up as soon as I get it done. Well, you know? yeah, I'm but, the same uh, way with my YouTube, actually. But the the um, with the podcast, because, uh, you know, you have to do coordinate these things with other people. <laughs> it can be kind of, and sometimes people are promoting stuff. So some like there's, it, there's almost no option and all, and be, like you, you know, you have to plan it out for like a couple of weeks if you want it to be consistent. It's yeah, it's tough. And also like the season's coming up. So for us, like we grow professionally. So, um, you know, I've kind of got to get them all done, uh, before, you know, the season really kicks off. Um, 
So it's a little complicated yeah, in that, that way. Sense. But yeah. 